I'm going to take you far, far away. I'm going to talk about my latest research, which is dealing with, as you just heard, with deep space. What you see here is the first patented spaceship in history. It was designed in, as you can see, in 1901 by Frederick Thompson. It was actually an electrically powered mechanical dark ride, which was developed for the Pan American exhibition in Buffalo, New York. It was a multimedia moon simulation, a trip to the moon. People would enter a large building. They would take place in this spaceship that was actually built. And then through all kinds of devices, for example, flapping wings, Earth was painted on a canvas, and then with, using pulleys, the Earth would recede. The spaceship would leave Earth, would fly through space, and would actually land on the moon. Then the visitors would be allowed to get off the spaceship. They would enter a paper mache moon landscape. They would be welcomed by dwarf actors, would witness a show by the man on the moon, and then the whole attraction would be over. It was very successful, actually. 400,000 people visited this. It was a huge hit. And the designers actually, after the exhibition, moved it to Coney Island, where they called it, where it became part of the Luna Park, because the spaceship was called Luna. And that's actually where the name Luna Park comes from. Why am I talking about this? Why am I introducing my talk about interstellar space with some construction from the 19th century? Well, if you look at the design of this particular spaceship, it's very clear how difficult it is for our imagination to think in the future. The design of this particular spaceship is very deeply rooted into its own time. It reflects technologies from the day, such as ornithopters, airships. And if we move further, we can see that even in these examples, they're always deeply rooted in their own time. You can see on the left-hand side the USS Enterprise, Star Trek, which is a typical symbol of the space age, aerodynamic, except you don't really need aerodynamics in outer space. It's kind of vacuum there. And then you have the beautiful Star Wars designs, and they're very typically 70s angular designs. Now, when we're talking about going into interstellar space, there is one particularly defining feature of a trip through deep space, through interstellar space, the space between stars. It's unpredictable. This is in big contrast to what you can see here. This is an image, a, a schedule of the Apollo program. This was uh, taken care of in a very different way. Basically, what they did is they they got closer and closer to the moon, step by step, charting and trying to understand all the different things that could go wrong, kind of mapping all the contingencies, and then finally they made a trip all the way down to the surface of the moon. That's how most space exploration missions are being designed. Now, when you go into deep space, you cannot use this trick anymore. It's too far, far out, and you can't just go into deep space and then come back and tune a few things, so you need a different approach. There are two, ba two ways you can handle this. The first one is redundancy, and redundancy is something that is used in this fantastic initiative, which is called Breakthrough Starshot. It was announced last year in April with the support of uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Stephen Hawking. It's the first interstellar mission that mankind is currently developing. They're very tiny spacecraft. It's an unmanned mission, obviously. We're not ready to send people to different stars. They're very, the concept here is to send very tiny spacecraft probes to a different star using light sails, and then beaming a very powerful laser from Earth onto the sails, accelerating the craft with a very, to a very high speed, let's say 20% of the speed of light, and then with this speed, those craft could reach the nearest star in about 20 years, which is not bad. And the idea would be that when the craft passes the star, it would beam back photos to Earth with a light of speed. So basically, in about 25 years, we could have first images of a different star. All the technologies are not in place yet, but like I said, um, they're working on it. And it's an example of redundancy because what they're planning to do is they're planning to send out a swarm of these, many of these, and hopefully one will arrive. Now, there is another approach. And the other approach is something that, was, that came up to me when I was looking at this. This is a, a robot without a particular fixed body. Foam bot from, um, uh, developed at the University of Pennsylvania a few years ago. And what you can see here is actually a robot that actually, when it's encountering a particular physical challenge, it calculates the physical body it needs to overcome that challenge. It will distribute the, its joints that ha it has at its disposal on the floor. It will connect the joints using polyurethane foam, 
it will create a body on the fly, it will then calculate a movement scheme to move the body and it will overcome the obstacle. Which I thought was incredibly cool. This is not even a polymorphic robot, you know, like Transformers robots, which have a few configurations. This is really a robot that can take any shape. And this gave me the idea to start thinking about developing starships that actually evolve over time, that can reshape themselves uh, during the journey according to the different needs of uh, of what's happening around them and also the different uh, things that are changing inside the spaceship, which I will explain in a bit. I'm actually not an aerospace engineer. I'm a biologist, as you, as you could just hear. And only recently I've jumped into the field of space systems. And my original biological research was deformities of the teeth of larvae of non-biting midges. I worked on this for six years. Very interesting, I actually got a PhD in this, go figure. No wonder I moved on to other things. But the thing is, it is really useful because now I'm actually applying my developmental biology background into aerospace. Now, thinking about self-developing space systems is nothing new. For example, this is a very nice example of a proposal that NASA brought out in the 80s of a self-replicating lunar factory. It's basically an autonomous factory in which machines would build a system, a factory, for example, infrastructure, and the machines would self-replicate to keep on producing more of the infrastructure using lunar soil. Now, today, with all the new technologies around, and especially 3D printing, suddenly the idea of building things on, in space on the fly have become much more realistic. And actually, right now, in the International Space Station, there is a 3D printer uh, created by Made in Space that is actually used to run experiments. And I believe that 3D printing could be a real game changer in the future of space travel. Now, when we're thinking about a spacecraft, a starship, that develops itself over time, it's traveling at a very high speed, where do the resources come from? The thing is, it can't really stop to find some stuff and then move on. It's traveling way too fast. It takes too long to, to decelerate. So basically what you need to do is you need to take all your raw materials on board. And it's basically a bit like this, like an embryo, like a chick egg. You know, the, the, the yolk is basically the raw material. It's all self-contained. And the raw material over time develops into this complex thing, which is a small chick. So this is the core concept of what I'm proposing here. It took me years to come up with this, three squares. Anyhow, you have a spaceship which is like an active component, there is raw materials, and then there is constant bootstrapping of growth and evolution. And the growth and the, evolu the, growth and the evolution are basically stimulated because, because of environmental changes. The interstellar medium, the, the open space between stars, is not constant. There are different kinds of challenges, such as radiation, impacts of micrometeorites, etc. And there's, of course, also internal change changes. Your populations might grow and might need more space. Now, what kind of materials are you going to take on board? Shipping materials from Earth and moving them into space is really expensive, so we come up with the idea, because I'm working on this with many different people at my university in Delft with a whole student team, we came up with the idea of using asteroids and clicking a proto-starship to an asteroid and then gradually over time during the journey use the asteroids for resources. And the asteroid could be used for resources both to develop the ecosystem and to develop the architecture because it's known that asteroids contain both organic material, water, and different types of metals. Now, there is a difference between growth and evolution, and I need to make that distinction here. Growth is the way in which we're developing our model is a repetition of the same system. It's a particular system works, and then you don't even need to change it. Evolution is something else. Evolution is like really changing the morphology of the whole system. And this is how we look at it. The spaceship, the starship, is traveling and has a sensing horizon, which is a, a term or a concept that comes from robotics. It can sense what's coming up. If what's coming up is very similar to what was already happening, it'll grow. If it's very different, it'll start to evolve. And this is a kind of concept that we've been developing. Now, this is all very well but we can't really build any starships yet. So what are we going to do with these ideas? And this is a beautiful study, a series of studies done by Carl Sims in the 90s that showed me how they could be explored. And what Carl Sims did was he evolved virtual creatures. 
These are computer simulations in which virtual creatures are evolving a body morphology over time using genetic algorithms. It's like Darwinism and mathematics completely combined with each other. And you see an evolution that otherwise you would never be able to predict. And this is a very interesting technique. And so we're basically using a very similar technique. And this is the model we're currently developing. We're not done yet. Take an asteroid. We, like I said, we click on the proto starship. We move the asteroid to the front. It becomes the shield. So it's an ablative shield. If there's any impacts in the front, you lose a bit of your asteroid, but your starship is safe. And then we defined a typology of modules for our architecture. We have processing, we have manufacture, we have storage, we have habitation, and we have life support. And there are certain rules in which these modules can grow. And this is the kind of architectural model that we're currently developing. And we're really interested to see what will happen if we predefine a particular interstellar trip with all kinds of challenges, and then to throw one of our designs into that simulation and see what happens during the journey. It's like self-developing architecture. Now, it's always interesting when you talk about space to see how much you can learn from that exercise for Earth. And I think when we're dealing with uncertain futures, it makes no sense to regress to static solutions from the past. On the contrary, I really believe we should embrace ongoing change, uncertainty, and we should really try to increase adaptability and nurture it. And in the end, I think we should let evolution be what it always has been best at, an endless stream of ongoing change. Thank you.